Welcome to Untold Stories of the Torah, a masterclass in Jewish history, presented by Rabbi Shmuel Aber. Part two of the story of Devoira. So far, Barak, listening to the prophecy of Devoira, gathers 10,000 soldiers goes to the top of Har Tavar, which was a direct threat to King Yavin and Sisera, who have been controlling the land of Israel for the past 20 years. And more soldiers from the Jewish people get inspired and they also join. But compared to the sheer size of Sisera's army, the, the, it's just no threat. It's not really a battle or a war of any degree. It's essentially a suicide mission. There's no chance that that Barak could defeat Sisera's army. The Barabinos says the Jewish people gathered as an open challenge to Sisera. That's really what it was. Going to the top of Har Tavur was an open, an open challenge. And it was a very, very important first step of the battle. It, it wasn't where the battle actually took place, but the mountain Har Tavur got the credit because that's where they originally get, gathered. And that's really where the entire battle was was instigated. That's where, you know, that's how it really started. Yom Kuchemoni brings a really interesting story. During the time of the giving of the Torah, many mountains came forth to try and get the incredible privilege of being the one that the Torah was going to be given on. Eventually, of course, Har Sinai, Mount Sinai is the one that, that won and the Torah was given on Har Sinai. But originally, the, the two mountains that came forward with a motive that was valid was the mountain of Tavur and Har Carmel, Mount Carmel. And Hashem said, the, in, in Yaakov Shemoni brings it down, although the Torah wasn't given on them, and was given Har, on Har Sinai, their motivation that, uh, that inspired them to come and try to fight to have the Torah given upon them was something very beautiful. And Hashem said, I'll choose both of these mountains to be the locations of great future events. So Har Tavur became the famous start of the battle against Sisera, one of the greatest Jewish victories in Jewish history. And Har Karma became one of the most incredible moments with a famous story with Eliyahu, which we're going to definitely cover in a later podcast. So both of them, although they didn't get what they wanted to have the Torah given upon them, because their motivation was so pure, they did get to have incredible moments in history chosen for them. And in this particular case, the war of the Devarius War and Barak's War was chosen to be started on this incredible mountain. Hashem drew Sisra's heart to the war against his better judgment. His astrologers actually told him that if you go to war, you will never return. And Sisra was so inspired to go to the war regardless, he just ignored his better judgment and went and gathered an army. Again, an, an army that seemingly couldn't have been defeated, but he went against his better judgment, against the astrologers' better judgment. The Avis Yonason, Yonason he says that Sisra himself was an astrologer. And he looked into the constellations to try to understand whether he would be successful. And he saw blood. So he assumed, like all the rest of his battles, that he was seeing the blood of his enemy. And of course, like most stories dealing with astrology, people just don't look correctly. And the blood he saw was his own. In Medrash, in Medrash Bamidra, Bamidra, Bamidra Rabbah, Rav Yanai HaKoyen says like this, just as there were 31 kings in the times of Yeshua, we started off in the previous podcast talking about Yeshua's battles when he first came into the land of Israel. And the war and the war in Yericho, there was 31 kings that Yeshua had to deal with, you know, in the land of Israel. Sister also had to deal, Sister also gathered 31 um, kings and Barak and Devoria had to contend with 31 kings against his men. Now what's so interesting is these kings were not kings that were living per se in the land of Israel. It's almost like they had embassies in the land of Israel. And when they heard that Barak had declared war against Sisera and King Yavin, they were extremely excited. And they said, we can, we'll send our armies to come and help. So Sisera said, what payment do you want? And you could see that the, the anti-Semitism was so strong in these kings. They said, we don't, we don't need payments. 
We'll send our soldiers ourselves. We'll pay silver to our own men to fight. All we want to do is drink the waters of the land of Israel. There's no more, there's no more favorable land than the land of Israel. And they wanted to attack the Jewish people and take over the land of Israel. So even though there was no, really no motivation, King Yavin and Sisra, you know, it, they, they considered Israel to be their land. But these other 31 kings really had no agenda and no reason to be attacking Jewish people. Their just natural hatred of Jewish people was so strong that even though they had no reason, or they had embassies in the land of Israel, they were like, well, we're going to send our entire armies. And such a massive international force... Uh, all gathered to attack the Jewish people. The Marzul says exactly like, this is this is from the Marzul on Medrash Rabba, which says that these thirty-one kings had massive other lands and small little portions of the lands of Israel, and that was enough to motivate them to attack the Jewish people. It's almost like the United Nations, every single leader from the United United Nations, all sending their entire militaries to go fight against the Jewish problem. Now, in order to understand the war before we actually talk about the war itself, who was Sisera? Sisera was the general of King Yavin, and Yalkut Shemani says that Sisera was 30 years old. Later on, if you want to understand just how wicked he was, like what degree of wickedness we're talking about, he was later on going to become the Gilgal of Haman. Haman lived many, many years later, but Haman was a Gilgal. He was a reincarnation of Sisera. So it gives you a tiny understanding of just how bad Sisera was and how wicked he was. He had a very powerful roar. He could scream. There was not a city that could stand up to his scream. Even wild animals, when they heard him screaming, would flee from him. And a very interesting detail, which is just... I think, fascinating. When he would bathe in the Kishon River, which we're going to talk about soon, there was enough fish that came up in his beard that could feed several people. It seems like a massive beard, and he was a massive person, and he was an absolute force to be reckoned with, not just in actual strength, but also his actual shout. His scream was terrifying, and of course he was, him and his mother, as we'll talk about later on, were deeply involved in in witchcraft and astrology and and these types of dark dark magic. So when Sisera heard that Barak was declaring war against him, he gathered his 900 iron, iron chariots and all the nations that were with him, and he gathered by the Nachal Kishon beside the Kishon um, stream, let's call it, which runs along the the breadth of Israel, up up in the north, not too far away from Har Tavar itself, and he gathered the most tremendous army, the Targum, which usually just translates the 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 verses. A lot of times, will add a lot of extra, a lot of extra information. In this case, the Targum mentions the size of. Sister's army. There were 40,000 generals, each of whom controlled 100,000 men. Again, that's 4 billion soldiers. This is an international army. This is the world gathering to go to war against the Jewish people. Additionally, that wasn't the whole army. There was 50,000 swordmen, 60,000 spear bearers, 70,000 shield bearers, an an additional 70,000 archers, and then this terrifying force of 900 chariots. And the 900 chariots is what really sounds like the most terrifying part of the army. These Iron chariots, I imagine them to be modern day tanks, just completely unstoppable in a time when there was just nothing to contend with the iron chariots. The one edge that the Jewish people had at the start of the war, which was very quickly going to be taken away from the Jewish people, was the height. The cha- iron chariots would have a hard time getting up the mountain. Har Tavar was high, it's a beautiful, round looking mountain. It actually looks like how people draw. Mountains, it's nice and round, and it, 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 looks, it looks like a beautiful mountain. Chariots might have a very, iron chariots especially, would have a very difficult time going up to the top of the mountain. But the rest of the, the, rest of the army was just so tremendously large. The forces were so large that they spanned a distance from Sanach to Megiddo, which is the area in Menashe. But it, it's, this is a very, very large distance from one side of the army to the other side of the army. And... They all came, a massive, tremendously large force. Now, Byron actually, unfortunately, he points out the, the contrast, that the, the enemies of the Jewish people were so united in their hatred of the Jewish people. And the Jewish people, they were very united, but unfortunately, as we mentioned in the previous podcast, there were some people who avoided the war. You can understand why it was very, very scary. On the other hand, the, the, the Jewish unity was great, but it could have been a lot greater. And it's just, it's, a, it's an unfortunate contrast. 
And the Radak points out the hatred of the Jewish people was so strong at the time. This war, this, this um, army that, that Barak had gathered, they hated Jewish people with such an incredible passion that they had already committed that they're not going to take any captives in this war and they're not going to redeem any captives. Like if they do manage to grab anyone, they have every intention to kill everyone and they don't want, there's no amount of money that could free a Jewish person. This was like the kind of the commitment they had before the start of the war. So, once they were all gathered, the Jewish people, the Jewish people heard that Barak had gathered the army. So, in addition to the ten thousand, the more Jewish people started joining. Naphtali and Zavulon were part of the original group, but Yisachar, who was very close on the map to them, they joined the the army as well. And it's really interesting because based on the songs of praise that the various sings afterwards, we have a really good understanding of who which tribes joined the war and which tribes had alibis and which tribes tried to get out of it. In the case of Yasaka, who for them pr- predominantly were all scholars, terrorist scholars, who really had no place in a war and really could have had an excuse to say, listen, we're not people of we're not people of battle and you know we don't really belong at the war, so you know we're 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 gonna excuse ourselves. These, this tribe, they came right under Barak's um, um, call, even though they weren't officially called, and they joined the war, which was an incredible, was a beautiful um, thing to see. People that weren't officially invited deciding to join anyway. Ruvain, who was on the other side of the Jordan, they wanted to see what the outcome of the war was. So they actually played both sides. The Targum says that they, they, they told each side, they told Sisera, listen, you only care about Israel proper, and we're on the other side of the Jordan, so we're your friends, don't worry about it, we're staying off the, out of the war. And they told the Jewish people, listen, you know, we're, we're Jewish people, we're on your side of the, of, the, of the war. And so they kind of just wanted to see who's going to be successful. Is, is Devoria going to have a real miracle together with Barak and the Jewish people going to win? Or is Sisera, the natural order of things, is Sisera going to win and then annihilate the Jewish people? Um, so once they saw that things were going a little bit better, then they quickly joined in. But Devoria asked rhetorically, why did Ruvain choose to be on the other side of the Jordan? That's a scary part in Israel to leave. That's what faces all the rest of the enemies across the world. Why did Ruvain choose to be, live on the edge of Israel if they're so scared to join a war? She asks, she says that this, this needs to be investigated. What, what, what happened to Ruvain during this war? Why didn't they show? Now, Gilad, which is part of Menashe, also on the eastern side of the, of the Jordan, they did come to the war. Um, Rashi and others do say that the very criticism that didn't come, but many rabbis say they did join the war, and this was a further criticism to Ruvain. Ruvain was north on the other side of the war, on the other side of the Jordan, which meant Ruvain was very close to the battle. Gilad is a lot more south on the other side of the Jordan, so the fact that Gilad shows up was an even uh, even greater criticism to Ruvain. If Gilad could show up and they're not even near the war. What business did Rufain have to, to shirk his responsibility to help the Jewish people in the battle? Don as well gets got a lot of criticism of the fact they didn't join. Their tribal land is extremely close. They're also on the right side of the Jordan, of the Jordan, which means they're in Israel proper in the north. And the question that's obvious is why did they not join? It was so extreme, unfortunately, that they put their possessions on the boats, getting it ready that if in the in a moment's notice, if things really go south, they could quickly push the boats with all the possessions on the other side of the Jordan and could escape. And again, this was a deep criticism that the Jewish people are going to battle. It's a battle which, yes, is, is extremely impossible to win, but all the Jewish people should have rallied in to defend each other. There is also one other tribe, Asher, that they weren't criticized. They didn't join, but they weren't criticized, and they were quite close to the war. And <clears throat> The reason they were, weren't criticized is because they, have, they had a lot of cities with un, unwalled cities that were very easy to be attacked. And so the Matsuda says that they were worried about enemies literally attacking the second that they left their, their section of Israel. And therefore, the fact that they didn't jo- join the war in, in the case of Usher was entirely understandable because... They, they, had, they had to take care of their, their, their own lands and they couldn't afford to leave it unarmed. One other, um, let's call it, um, thing to understand was a nearby city. And it's a big discussion who exactly was it a nearby city, was it a person, was it a star? There was a location, we'll go on to the first opinion. There was a location that 
the, that was nearby. The, the Maru, for example, says, a location nearby that could have helped. It was called Meroiz. And this location chose not to come. And it sounded like they could have been very, very helpful for the war, or there could have been something, there could have been some great help, and they chose just not to come. Rashi says that it was either a star or as a very important person that lived nearby. And whatever the case was, they chose not to come. Whether it was a star, later on, as you're going to see, the star is going to play a very large part of this war. And this star, which is Meroy's sister's star, the star of the astrology that represents Sistra, chose not to come and help. Or it could have been a very important person or a big warrior that was nearby that didn't actually come to the war. And later on in the song of Devoria, Devoria curses this person, saying... This person is a really, really bad person for not coming. In fact, to such a degree that Barak, after the war, took a shofar and he blew the shofar 400 times and put this person into khayr and put this person into excommunication because this person belonged at the war for whatever reason it was and chose not to come. And it was just such, an, such a horrible insult to the Jewish people that he was, he was excommunicated by Barak himself. And... What's interesting is, and again, it's far beyond the scope of this class, but it's just a very interesting thing to be aware of, the tour, and I mean, all the, all the different um, um, law codifiers who talk about the laws of excommunication, a lot of them will quote the story of Meroiz and quote the Barak putting him in excommunication to understand how excommunication works in Torah. Because excommunication, excommunication, especially in the olden days when, when it was a real power and a, and a very scary threat understanding how it works was able to, it, it, a lot of it is comes from this story understanding the punishment of Meroes and understanding how excommunication worked in this incident in the in in this story over here of course understanding it fully is beyond the scope of the of, of this particular class but it's just interesting to know that these laws a lot of these laws have their origin have the origins in our story the sifri says that when Devorah curses Meroiz, Devorah says they're cursed because they didn't come to the help of Hashem. Now, of course, Hashem doesn't need any help. So what does that mean, that they didn't come to the help of Hashem? And the answer is that because they didn't help the Jewish people, it's like they didn't help God. Hashem loves the Jewish people, and people that help the, Jew, help the Jewish people, it's like they're helping God. And in this case, Meroiz could have helped the Jewish people. Because he didn't, it was like he didn't come to the assistance of Hashem. Now, uh, uh, the, the actual war itself. Before we begin the war, it's very important to understand earlier context for the war. In Gemara Pesachim, it says like this, when the Jewish people were leaving Egypt, now we're going back a good 166 years, actually 206 years, before the Jewish people, well, after the Jewish people left Egypt, there was an incredible miracle. The sea split and the Jewish people came out safely, and the Egypt and the Egyptians are chased after them in their six hundred chariots with Pharaoh leading the leading the way. Were all drowned, and the entire army was all drowned in the sea. And the Jewish people made it out, out safely. And when they came out safely, there were some people before, you know, the I guess the song. There were some cynics. And the cynics started saying, you know, the same way that we made it out safely, you know, and we went on dry land, maybe that same phenomena happened to the Egyptians. How do we know they're really dead? Maybe it's not really that big of a miracle. You know, we're not really safe. And Hashem was very upset because Hashem said, this is one of the greatest miracles in human history. The sea split and the Jewish people came out alive and all the Egyptians are, are dead and under the ocean. I can't have people say that this that this full, the miracle didn't happen to the full extent. Shashem called the angel of the sea and told the angel of the sea, all those Egyptians that that six hundred chariots that that are swallowed up deep into the abyss of the of the water, spit them out. So the angel of the sea told Hashem, "Is master of the universe? Is there a servant whose master gives him a gift?" The, the gift was, you know, food for the fish in the sea, and then takes it away from him. Hashem has just given the sea this incredible gift of all this food for the fish to eat, and now Hashem is saying, spit it all out so in, into dry land so that people could all see the incredible miracle. So Hashem said, don't worry. I promise you one and a half times the reward. So 600 plus half of that, an additional 300, you'll get 900 chariots later on in history. And the angel of the sea said to Hashem, 
what type of servant can issue a claim against his master? How am I going to come back later on and, and, and say, well, give me, give me the 900 chariots? You know, I'm going to spit out the 600 um, chariots and then that's going to be the end of the story. I'm not going to have the guts to ever come back to you and, and, and ask for it again. And so Hashem promised the sea. The Kishon River will be the guarantor. The Kishon River, which, which feeds into the Red Sea, that will be the guarantor. And that way you don't have to feel embarrassed to, to come to me. You could go to the guarantor and you could ask the guarantor, listen, you owe me a debt. And once the, the angel of the sea heard this, straight away the 600 Egyptian chariots were, um, were spilled out to the side. The Jewish people saw their dead enemy and they sang praise to Hashem. That's, that's going to become a very important important factor of the war, to understand the pieces of the war itself. The warrior tells Barak that although they had a powerful position, and that's all they had, they had um, 10,000 Jews plus a, a collection of additional Jews who were inspired and saw Barak's tiny little army and decided to join, the only advantage they had was being at the top of the mountain. And the warrior says, Hashem has given, them, given your enemy into your hand, leave the, the Mount Tavar, descend and go and, and attack the enemy. And that was it. Now Barak was going to lose the one edge that he had being on top of the mountain. And even before Barak did it, he listened to Tavar, he marched down the mountain with all the men behind him, which was definitely uh, in, their, in their minds, I imagine, or any, any rational person, I'm sure they had incredible belief, but a rational person's mind, it was a suicide mission. But even before they reached the enemy, the sounds of the chariots and horses became terrified and they began to flee. The chaos and the panic was so great that Marikara says that the, the, the loud thunder confused sister's enemy to such a degree they began stabbing each other. They began literally killing each other. And then Hashem said, this massive army, of what could be counted to be billions of soldiers, they just came for free. They didn't say, we want any money. We're going to, they said they're going to fully come for free. Hashem said, I'll also bring my own enemy that won't need any payment. So Hashem told the stars, they were in the orbit. Hashem told, and it sounds like it wasn't all the stars, it was specific stars to start descending towards, towards Earth. And those stars started giving very direct heat to the army of Sisera. And so in addition to all the chaos of the thunder and the, and the fear and, the, and the, the, all, all that terrifying experience that they were already experiencing, the heat from the stars began to heat up the iron chariots, began to heat up the, the armor, and it, it was so hot that even the, the hooves of the horses, it, it melted away and, 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 and the horses, in extreme panic, began stampeding in all different directions. But the people themselves heated up so badly in their armor that they had to all rush into the Nachal Kishon. They all had to rush off into the, the, this creek, this river that flowed in front of the mountain, which Barak was, was charging towards. The, the, that river was in the way of them. And they all rushed into the river to literally cool themselves down from the extreme, extreme heat of the stars that were shining so brightly and so hotly against them. And, that, and then the Kishon itself began to stir. It began to rise and it, with incredible force took all these, these people that had been inside the river and threw them Along, you know, in the tide of that river, the river woke up and it, the Kishon River flows right into the sea. And so that was it. The army, for the most part, was almost entirely destroyed. Within, within moments, Barak didn't even fight. Barak only had to chase the survivors who in extreme, as you can imagine, someone go, an army watching this all happen in front of them, literally a, a, a massive, massive army entirely just destroyed in moments. They ran. Sisra was still alive and Sisra was on a chariot and then he realized he's going to get overtaken so he cleverly jumped out of the chariot and let the chariot run continue off towards Harish Sagaim with all the rest of the chariots Sisra had no problem abandoning his people he realized that this was this this war was over his plan was as we'll mention to regroup and re-attack the Jewish people. But this particular battle was over, and, and he knew that. So he pretended like he was still inside his chariot. He pushed the chariot off, going towards Choresh HaSagayim, which was their city. And Barak, not realizing, continued to chase after Sisra's chariot, while Sisra himself started making his way 
in the opposite direction, trying to escape across the, the, the Jordan. Now, in order to understand the next part, I need to take a step back and explain quite a bit of history. Moshe Rabbeinu, 200 and change years earlier, when he escaped from Egypt and then went to Ethiopia, and if you want to have the full story of that, go to the two series, par- two series podcasts that we already did, The Early Life of Moshe. Moshe eventually made it to Yisroi in Midian. And Moshe was put into prison for a year. Tzipora saved his life for the whole year, made a condition with the father, and then freed Moshe. Moshe got the stick, and then Moshe made his way back to Egypt. But Moshe married the daughter of Yisro, Tzipora. And later on, when Yisro hears about, about the splitting of the sea, and then the fighting of Amalek, Yisra becomes extremely inspired and he comes to the Jewish people. And whether, based on the Gemara and Zavachim, whether he joined the Jewish people before the giving of the Torah or after the giving of the Torah, whatever the case was, Yisra went back home eventually to convert the rest of his family. And he was successful to, in, 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 in that regard. And Yisra's family, who, be, who became this group called the Canaan, they joined the Jewish people and became righteous converts of the Jewish people. And they entered the land of Israel together with Yehoshua, an incredibly dedicated family, an incredibly righteous family, and a family with an incredible love of Torah. They were related to Moshe very closely. I mean, their the Tzipora, whether their sister or their aunt or their great aunt or their great great aunt, was married to Moshe, so they were very closely related to Moshe, and they were extremely special, an extremely special family. When they arrive in Israel, Yeshua tells them, they didn't, they didn't come from one of the tribes, they were converts, so Yeshua tells them, listen, you're special people, there was a land next to Yericho that had been earmarked to be given to whichever family in 440 years would lose their portion in Israel to build the base of Migdash. Yeshua already knew that in Yerushalayim was going to be the base of Migdash, the temple, and Yeshua understood that whoever's going to lose that property is going to be very upset. So Yeshua said, I'll earmark some property in, next to Yerichai, that property will be exchanged for whoever loses their portion in, in Yerushalayim itself, because Yerushalayim, the city, has to belong to all the tribes equally, and it can't belong to one particular tribe. So whether Yehuda or Binyamin, they will get that portion, and they, they will move to that new, beautiful, fertile land right outside of Yerichai. But Yeshua tells the family of the Canaan, Moshe's family, Tepoya's family, Yisroi's family, listen, until then, for the next 440 years, this is your land, live here, enjoy it for your 440 years to enjoy this beautiful land. And they did. They moved into the land, but time went by, and a new leader, the first judge, Asniel ben Kenaz, in Yehuda, in the south of Israel, became the Jewish leader. He was a tremendously righteous man and an incredible Torah scholar. And they decided... We could either stay in this land or we could move into tents. And being that we're not actually in, in real houses in part of someone's ancestral land, we could move into tents and we could live a nomad's life, but we'll, we'll be next to the Jewish leader. We could learn more Torah. So that was it. They gave up their rights to the, they gave up their land. They essentially just picked up and left, went to the south of Israel, parked themselves, themselves next to, in the, in the portion of Yehuda, and they learned at the feet of Asniel ben Kenaz. They learned under him. Now, many years later, now 166 years have gone by, and Hever, one of the members of this family, sees what's going on in the north of Israel and realizes he could be of assistance. He says, if I'm here right now, but if I move to the north of Israel, I could be a very clever liaison between the Jewish people and this horrible person, King Yavin. And so the Canaan had already had a peace treaty with Yavin, that Yavin didn't, didn't believe them to be a threat. Maybe he didn't understand how dedicated they were to the Jewish people. So he had made a peace treaty with the Yisroi family, with the Canaan. And so Hever left them. He left that area. He moved up to the north of Israel. And he parked his tent and his wife's tent and his family's tent next to him and his wife had separate tents. He parked their tents right next to where the battle was taking place. And the Barbanel, for example, says that Chavis loved the Jewish people so much, he saw an opportunity to help, and he didn't want to be suspicious, so he pretended like a massive family fight had happened. He told everyone that I have a big fight with, with my family in the, in the south of Israel, 
the rest of the Canaan, and he picked himself up, he moved to the, the north of Israel, and no one thought much of it, no one assumed that he was trying to gather intel and help the Jewish people, they just assumed that, you know, he just, he had left, and now he wants to have nothing, uh, nothing to do with uh, the Canaan in the south, and he pitched his tent between Har Tavar and Harish Sagayim. They were nomadic, they lived in tents, and he moved his tent nearby in order to be available to help. He had a wife. This Hever had a wife, and his wife's name was Yael. Yael was a judge, had earlier on been a judge of the Jewish people. She had been a judge at the time of Shamgar Benanos, and she had judged the Jewish people as an actual judge. The rabbis say that she, the Rashi and Matsuda, say that she was actually a judge before the Varya was a judge. She was a judge. She isn't listed in the official number of the judges. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just because only some people believe that she was actually a judge at that time. And she, but she, is a, she was officially a judge of the Jewish people. And she was an inspiration to the Jewish people. During her time, there was no complete redemption to the Jewish people. And that could be possibly why she isn't listed during, as one of the, the judges. Even the Sham Gabin Anas is listed. But... She was exceptionally beautiful. The Gemara in, in Megillah says she had, she had extreme beauty and she had a beautiful voice. I don't fully understand what that means, but somehow the beautiful voice amplified her exceptional beauty. And she was, she was part of the Canaan family. She was, she was married to Hever, this man who had moved to the north. The Bnei Saska says, interesting, just to understand how great she is, that she later on she would be reincarnated into Esther. So Esther was a reincarnation of Yael. So again, just for context to understand how incredibly special Yael was, you can understand from her reincarnation just how special she was. So they're both living right next to where war broke out right afterwards. Sisera, meanwhile, is running from the battlefield. battlefield and although this battle was an incredible success, not even through the effort of Barak, this is all Hashem. Hashem literally just fought on behalf of the Jewish people. The battle was entirely over, but the war was far from over. The Major Shemais Rabbah says that Sisra still had the complete un- ability to annihilate the Jew- Jewish people. It's incredibly important to understand that when I'm trying to understand the story. The war, the battle might have been exceptionally successful, but so long as Sisra was still alive, he had every intention and every ability to annihilate all the Jewish people. And that was his intention. So even though he was running from the from the war like a coward, and this battle was this battle was entirely over, Barak was chasing people and, and dividing the spoils and killing anyone that was in the way, <coughs> Sisra had the easy ability to regather and to start a new war and the next war would be successful. So Yael sees him running, and Yael very clearly understands that. So Yael went out to meet Sisra, and she told Sisra, turn in, my lord. This is actually a quote from the Pasuk itself. She says, turn in to me, don't be afraid. And she convinced him to come into her tent. The last thing she wanted is for Sisra to escape the battlefield, because if Sisra escapes the battlefield and he's still alive, he will regather, and that's the end of the Jewish people. So, so Yael saw this incredible opportunity, being someone who officially was an ally of King Yavin, who was Sisera's king, Sisera was only the general, so she saw this as an incredible opportunity to trap him and to, to, to somehow stop him before he escaped, and that was the end of this incredible opportunity. Yael had her own tent, and Hever had his own, his own tent, and she brought Sisera into her own tent. And as, the, as is clear from the Gemara, her plan was to seduce Sisera until he was weak, and then kill him before he had a chance to escape and rally a fresh army to kill the Jewish people. So she invites him in with a lot of respect. She gives him a special dish to eat out of. She covers, she covers him with a rug, with a smicha, very strange word. Rishlakish, in fact, says, he says, I've gone, we've gone through the entire Torah and there's no such vessel, there's no such garment called a smicha. So what's, what does this mean? Covered with this rug, with this smicha, this special garment. Rather, Sreish Laka says this is a clear indication that it's a te- Hashem is testifying in the Torah itself, in, in the book of Shaitim, that Shemi Koi, if you break up the word Smicha, it literally makes two words. My name is here. The, the Reish Laka is saying Hashem testifies that her, 
behavior was entirely for the sake of Hashem. As you're going to see in the story now, she's going to seduce Sisera, and it's going to, it, you know, even though that's not going to, that's not the right thing to do, her behavior was entirely for the sake of Hashem. She didn't have any ulterior motives, no selfishness, no lust, nothing else. It, she literally was just trying to save the Jewish people, and this was the only way she can imagine doing it. And so she did something that was, is rather shocking, but at the same time, her in, motivation was up entirely lishma for the sake of Hashem. The Gemara says that she, that she, he asked for, well, the, the Pasuk actually first says, he asked for water, and then she gave him milk. And the milk tires people. So she gave him the milk to make sure that he was, to make sure that he was, that he was tired. And then the Gemara says that she had relations with him seven times in order to tire him out. And the Gemara says that that tr transgression for the sake of Hashem is equal to a mitzvah that's not for the sake of Hashem. And the Benish Chai says there's a big correlation between Yael and Aaron. Aaron also did, a, did what was a sin. He made a, a golden calf. But he did it entirely for the sake of the Jewish people. He realized that the Jewish people were to kill him like they killed his, his, his nephew. And again, go to the story of Kala if you want to have the full story of, of Hur's death. Aaron's dedication to the Jewish people and his love of the Jewish people and his motivations were entirely pure, yet Els was entirely pure as well. Even though she did something that was a sin, and it's forbidden to do this. A person, there's three sins a person is never allowed to transgress. The three sins are bound to an idol, no matter what the no matter what the circumstances is, a person's never even if the life is in danger, never allowed to bow down to an idol, never allowed to do forbidden marriage, which is exactly what happened over here, and never allowed to murder someone else. Nonetheless over here, Yael did something that was wrong. She did an actual sin, but her motivation was 100% pure. It doesn't make it right. We're still not allowed to do it. But at the same time, her motivation was 100% pure, her connection to God. It, 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 she was so inspired to save the Jewish people. And she understood that if not for doing this, the Jewish people would, would not make it. So she made she, she did this. The Gemara, in fact, in Nazi, compares Yael's intentions and says it was equal in part in par to the behavior of Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. And that's why all of these are called, all these women, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, and Yael, the fifth woman, are all called women that are blessed in the tent. Her behavior was so extraordinary, even though it was wrong, and it's not the way we're ever allowed to do it, Yael's behavior was so um, incredible that she was compared to the four matriarchs. The, the Ben Ishchai actually says, if you look at the name Yael, you see that it's, it's a... It's a, it, it stands for Yasu Avera Lishma. She did Yael, Yud, Ayin, Lamad, Yasu Avera. She did a sin, Lishma, but entirely for Hashem's sake. Motivated entirely for Hashem. So as I mentioned, Sisra asked for water. Yael gave him um, milk to make him tired and the, then covered him up. And then she told her, stand in the door of the tent, and if any person comes and inquires, and, you, and, and, and they say, is there a person here? Is there a man here? You should say no. The rabbis actually point out and say, Sisera was already talking about, he was already considered like dead at this point. And it wasn't even a lie for, him, for her to say, if there's anyone here, um, say no, because it was almost like he was dead. Interestingly, the Ramabi Pana, the Gedola Mukas say, that Rabbi Akiva came out of this union between Sisra and Yael. Others say that it wasn't that Rabbi Akiva was a descendant, per se, from Sisra and Yael. Rabbi Akiva might have been a descendant from Sisra, but, or, or he wasn't a descendant of Sisra, but rather Yael enabled Rabbi Akiva's soul to be freed you know, and to be to make the possibility for Rabbi Akiva later on to be born. The grandchildren of Sisera taught Torah to the Jewish people. This is something that we know. Once Yael had Sisera exhausted, then she took a tent peg, she took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him, and she put the, the peg of the tent to his temple, the side of his head, and she hammered, like holding the peg in her left hand and her, her and the hammer in her right hand, she she struck the peg till it went through his head, 
through his head, through and through, through both sides of his head, and into the ground itself. And he was in a deep sleep, and he swooned and he died. The Yaakov Shemayni says that, you know, that she used her left hand and her right hand, her left hand to hold the peg, as just mentioned, and the right hand to hammer. And she didn't want to use an actual weapon because because of the loye kligeva isha, she didn't want to have um, wearing uh, the clothes of a man. And there are opinions that say even using weaponry or wearing wearing weaponry is is not allowed. And I guess because she had a way of doing what she needed to do without having to, to use a weapon or whether it was available, etc. That's the reason why why she used that. And a miracle actually happened. That even though she was very weak, she was able to ham- hammer the peg through his entire head. And then she goes outside and she sees Barak chasing down, trying to find Sisra. He, the, Barak eventually realized that, that that chariot, iron chariot, didn't have Sisra inside. So Barak had to retrace his steps. And Yael tells Barak that, come and I will show you the man who you seek. And he came and he saw that Sisra was lying dead and there was a pen peg inside of his temple. And the that's essentially the end of the war. With Sisra the war, the, the battle was over, and although there was another war, and the Jewish people continued to fight against King Yavid, because Sisera was dead, and because the entire army with Sisera had been destroyed by Hashem, at that point, the rest of the war, as mentioned in the first podcast, wasn't that much, that hard of a, of a war anymore. It was mainly the first war that was the big miracle, was that, that was the, the challenging or the impossible part to actually complete. The Medjish Rabbah brings down together with other people that Sisra was someone who waited six hours waited six hours. And she waited six hours for him to come. Usually he came after three or four hours, says the Medrash. But this time after six hours, Sister's mother's waiting for him to arrive victoriously from battle. He was such a successful conqueror. Remember, he was only 30 years old, but he was such a successful conqueror. He never spent much time involved in battle, etc. And now she's waiting, it's not there. So she starts to get become very alarmed. And so she goes to this magical window. And there's different opinions of which order she does, whether the regular window or the magical. But she goes to a magical window called the Eshnav. She wanted to look through magic to try to determine where her son was. And she sees a vision in this magical vision window of her son lying on the floor. And there was a woman or two women um, standing next to, next to him. There was blood coming out of his head. And there was a, 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 a red um, garment around his neck as well. And she gave out a cry. She gave out a scream. A very, the Gemara brings down, Abaya, talk, Abaya in, the, in Sech Rosh Hashanah talks about you know, the, the, type, the, the type of scream that... that that's given. And the rabbi is saying in general, the type of scream that, she's, that she gave and that the targum of Yom Chua Yelachem, the Yabava is a discussion for, with the rabbis what exactly it sounds like. And what's so interesting is the scream that she gave out, the rabbis discussed that because they try to understand the blowing of the shefer on Rosh Hashanah, how should it sound? And the answer is, it should sound like sister's mother's crying out when she discovers that her son is dead. She then looked out the window and she wondered why she couldn't hear the sound of the chariots. And her sorcerers, and the Gemara Yishalmi says, uh, her daughter-in-laws, they comforted her. They said, it's a good prediction that you saw. You saw that your, your, your son lying on the floor with, with blood and, and two women on the side, which is Devaria and Yael, respectively, I assume. And she, they told her it means that soldiers are taking spoils from the Jewish people. They won the war, they're taking spoils, and these women represent the best of the spoils, and the, the blood or the red garment is a colored garment, you know, very expensive garments that Sisera, that Sisera has. Interesting, by the way, just a, 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 a point that the Ariza says that that she placed a demon when she actually tempted Sisra. It actually was a demon that she that she sent to tempt him. And from Vayikra Rabba as well. Additionally, just to, to talk about to finish off this topic, this topic of uh, Yael uh, tempting Sisra in order to kill him, the, it implies from Vayikra, Vayikra Rabba. Mom, Mom learns, learns like this that she didn't try to seduce him at all. She tried to delay him, or she tried to hold him from continuing to run off. But once 
that happened, he actually forced himself upon her. And once she, he became weak, then she took advantage and she killed him. Now the question that the Abayra and the Amalman both deal with is, how did Yael break the pact that the Canim had with King Yavin? Yael killed Sisera. Sisera, in fact, knew about this pact that King Yavin had with the Canim and had with Hever, and that's the reason he even agreed to come into the house in the first place. He didn't continue running. Our words, of, our word is very important, and yes, this person is someone that was trying to kill everyone, but breaking a pact is a very serious thing. So, how was it that that Yael could kill Sisera just like that? So, there are different answers. The Malbim, for example, points out that the Canim made the pact with King Yavin, and Sisera wasn't King Yavin. Sisera was a general King Yavin, but that wasn't the arrangement. The arrangement, he just assumed, you know, my king has the uh, pact, that means it extends to me as well, and it didn't extend to him as well. Or, for example, as the Malbim explains that, that because Hever had disconnected himself from the rest of the group, that was actually, that actually helped. Now Yael wasn't held by it, they had officially been in an argument with the rest of the Canim, and so therefore, they, went, they, they had separated themselves from that group. It was the group of the Canaan, that family that had made a pact with King Yavin, maybe even that extended to, extended to Sisha. But the second that Hever had left the family and disassociated himself with the family, at that point he wasn't held by the pact. Another explanation the Mabam gives is that the pact, war pacts are something that men are held by. Women are not connected to war and therefore they're not held by these war agreements and these war pacts. Um, Sister made his way into Yael's tent, not into Hever's tent. And at that point, Yael had the rights and the jurisdiction to do whatever she pleased at that point. And the Barabina also mentions that Hever didn't join the, the war um, and he didn't hurt the Jewish people. We didn't join the war either. After the war was over, came one of the largest and biggest moments in Jewish history. And it's funny how the war itself is a big deal, but what what is really famous is Shira's Devoria, is the incredible song that Devoria sung after the war. Essentially the thanking God, being appreciative to God for the tremendous miracle that happened. That's the that's the part that mo is most memorable in the story of Devoria. Now, one of the questions that we started the previous podcast with is how is it that that on the week that Pashas Pashalach that we read the in the Torah in the in the Shul we read the Parsha that talks about the crossing of the sea and the Haftarah which is always supposed to be connected to the Parsha itself is not the song of David corresponding to the song that Moshe sang after the sea, but rather it's this story, the song that Devorah sang. And the Semach Tzedek says in the name of his grandfather that the reason why we mention the story of Devorah's song and not the song of David is because after the Jewish people crossed the sea and they came out, they came out the other side and they saw the dead the Egyptians and the, the, the chariots that had, that had been destroyed, the men sang out, sang out praise to God. And the women also sang out praise to God, but they also danced and they used their instruments with joy. And says, explains the Samach Sedek in, in the name of the Alter Rebbe that because the women exhibited so much more joy and dancing, when it came time again to, to mention um, joy and to mention a song, we want to mention the song of the women this time. They proved themselves the first time around. So now when we're mentioning, we have a chance to, you know, invoke the moment of the of the crossing of the sea and the song of, of praise that followed, we want to mention a song of praise given by a woman because the first time around, the women, they showed their joy so much. The, the, the episode was so much more personal to them. The joy they exhibited was so much more personal and so much more extreme than the even the song and the praise of the men the medrash brings down kehelas rabba says all six miracles this story essentially that we're that we're bringing down all of it happened on the same day which is so tremendous that the same day that the various sang praise to hashem which we'll talk about in a moment is the same same day that the jewish people came to the originally and it's the same day that the sent for barak with instruction and the prophecy of about 
him taking the two tribes up the top of the mountain. It's the same day that Barak got the two tribes and got them up the mountain. It's the same day that they went to war. It's the same day that and won. It's the same day that Sisera died. And it's also the same day that divided the spoils. This was a very, very busy day. All of these things, says the Medrash, all occurred on the same on the same day. Song at the very beginning is different than the song of Moshe and the song of David. In the song of Moshe and the song of David, it says La Hashem to Hashem. But in this particular ver- this particular song, the song of the very at the very beginning, it says the song of the very, but it doesn't say to Hashem. Obviously, it's to Hashem, and she invokes Hashem throughout, and she thanks Hashem, and she gives credit to Hashem. It's it's. It's clear that this song is all about Hashem, but differently than the original Az Oz- Yashir, this song doesn't actually say to Hashem. And the reason is because she cursed someone, Hashem says, I don't want my name to be associated. Meshach Chachma says, Hashem doesn't want to unify his name with a curse. Because she, in the middle of the song, cursed somebody, Hashem said, don't, don't mention to Hashem at the very beginning of this curse. Devorah sang first, and then Barak sang, as mentioned in the first podcast. This was a punishment. When he insisted that Devorah come to the battle, Devorah said, okay, I'll come to the battle, but you're going to lose you're going to lose the credit. And the credit he lost, among the fact that the war wasn't attributed to him, he also lost the fact that this he was the one that was supposed to sing the song, and instead she sang the song first, and he became second to her in that. The Medrash Tanhuma records ten songs of history. There's 10 songs that are sung throughout the duration of history. The, and I'm going to mention them all, and, and obviously Devaria and Barak's song is one of them. In Egypt itself, the Jewish people sang a song. Then when they crossed the Red Sea, leaving Egypt, they sang a song. When they reached the wells in the desert, they sang a song. Moshe's famous ha- Ha'azino, the second last parsha of the Torah, is a song. Yeshua, after the war in Givoin, sang a song. This is the sixth song. The song of Devaria and Barak is the sixth song of history. Then David HaMelech sang a song. The eighth was the inauguration of the Beis Hamikdash? The song Miz Moshech Hanukkah Sabayis is the eighth song in history. And there's different variations of this list. I'm just going to go based on the version in Medrash Chumah. The song of songs Shir Hashirim, written by Shlomo Melch, a very long, the ninth song, and the final song is going to be the song of the coming of Mashiach. So there's ten songs that span history, the span the you know the entire scope of history, and the, the song of Devarah is the is the sixth of these songs. And when she sang the song, all the previous sins of the past 20 years of the Jewish people, as soon as Devaria sang that song, all the sins of the Jewish people were erased. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the, the actual songs itself to, to break it down and understand it, because it's beyond the scope of this, of this class. There's so much to learn and so much to understand in the song. But I'll just give you a general um, anatomy of, of the actual so- song itself. There's the introduction to the song. Then there's the blessing of Hashem. There's the Jewish history of the giving of the Torah until Devaya. Then there's the verse speaking about the miracles of the war. There's the Jewish people after the war that Tavera mentions. There's, then there's praise and critique for those who came and those who abandoned the war, the different tribes, as we mentioned earlier on, those who came and those who didn't. Then there's the miracles during the war. Then there's cursing Meroz and blessing Yael. And then there's the final words of what will happen to, to the wicked people. One very, I guess, sad um, sad part of the of the song, it's just a, 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 it's a sour note, let's call it in the song itself, is that Devorah talks about the earlier generations and she she puts them she puts them down a little. She talks in a negative way about the earlier generations, and then she said, "And open cities seized in these, in the among the Jewish people." This is a ver- a, one of the verses of the song, and she said, "They seized until I Devorah arose, until I arose a mother in the Jewish people, Amy Israel, a mother in the Jewish people." And the Gemara says that anyone who is a wise man or a prophet who displays arrogance, the wisdom or the prophecy will leave will lead them. And the proof is that later on, a few verses later, that was chapter, that was verse number nine, I believe. In verse number twelve, she actually says, "Uri uri devoida, uri uri She says, "Awake, awake, devoida." She realized that the prophecy had left her, and she actually tried to inspire herself, or Barak tried to inspire her in order to to awaken her to let the prophecy come back, so she can continue the 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 song. After the war was over. The Jewish people, as I mentioned, went to war against King Yovin, and they subdued and destroyed him. And for the remainder of the 40 years' tenure, the, the 40 years that Devaria was a leader, which includes 
um, the the time of the time before as well. The, the total forty years, the Jewish people remained dedicated to Hashem, and they had peace in the land of Israel. And one final note of the story is Mam Laez brings down that every single day in Gan Eden, Devarius sings the same same song that she sung originally. This song of praise to Hashem, thanking Hashem for the incredible miracle. Devarius has the incredible merit to repeat the same song over and over every single day in Gan Eden. Thank you for listening to Untold Stories of the Torah. If you enjoyed this episode, help us spread the word by subscribing to this channel and leaving us a review.